What's his name? What's his name? What's his name? What is his name? Amen. Woo. Woo. Yeah, let's give him a clap. Come on, all your heart. Put it in it. Yes. Father, thank you so much. Jesus, thank you for stepping out of heaven, coming to this earth in the form of a servant and humbling yourself to the extent of the cross that we might know your name. Not just a name that's out there somewhere, but a name that has a personal connection with us because your name is Jesus. You are our savior. You're our redeemer. You're the one that is, one that is changing our lives and rocking our world. You're the very one God that we have hope for in life and eternity. Mm. At the name of Jesus, every knee will bow and every tongue will confess. At the name of Jesus, every demonic spirit must flee. At the name of Jesus, there's power over every disease. At the name of Jesus, there's power over every calamity. At the name of Jesus, the waves must obey. At the name of Jesus, the demons must bow down. At the name of Jesus, we have power in his name. At the name of Jesus, the world is saved. God, we worship you because you've given our Savior the name above every name. God, may we never, ever get over what the name of Jesus means to us. Amen. 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 Mm. You know, I, I'm, looking, I'm looking forward to tonight. Do you know what happens tonight? No. We have a good excuse to eat. I mean, listen, we, you call it Super Bowl. It can be any bowl, right? We just want to go eat together, right? I know where our heart is, and, and I'm looking forward to going and eating and hanging out with my small group of people that, uh, that we do life together. We're a little dysfunctional, you know, but uh, they let me in anyway, okay? And we have a good time together. And, you know, this, this whole series um, that we're starting today is called We is greater than me. You know, sometimes in life, we start going through life and we make it all about us, don't we? We make our marriage about us. It's me, 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 what I need, what I need, what I want, what I want. And, and we miss out on some things because there will be a time in your life when you need the we, right? And I am so glad that we live in a church in a day that we have a church where we're able to make a difference in other people's lives. And we're able to help with other people because that's what the body of Christ does. I actually have a friend that uh, uh, we spoke about, I think last week, uh, you, we didn't tell you who, we just told you what. Uh, but his name's Milton and he comes to Crossroads. He's been coming to Crossroads for a long time. He always talks to me after the service. I love to talk to him uh, because he has a heart for God. And we were able to provide a way with some other folks for him to make it to church because he can no longer just walk. He has to be in a wheelchair. So a couple of weeks ago, we built a wheelchair ramp so that he could be at church. And he wanted me to personally thank you guys for doing that. He's sitting right over here. Will you raise your hand, Milton? Can you see me? Yeah. There you go. Praise Jesus. Praise Jesus. If you ever wonder why we need others, it's because someday we'll realize that we really need others because there are certain things that we can't do. And you know, it reminds me of, of a story in the Bible. Um, and in this story, it, it happened in a, a place called Capernaum. 
And, you know, sometimes we talk about stuff in the Bible. And if I said, hey, you know, it happened in Douglasville or Lithia Springs or, or Carrollton, if you're in Africa watching online today, you have no idea what that is, right? And we have a lot of people that watch around the world. So, you know, sometimes I, I, I isolate ourselves. So when I talk about Capernaum, I want you to know where it is. I have a map for you um, so that you can understand what's going on in these days. You see, Capernaum uh, was, a, was a town in Galilee. So Galilee is the whole region on this map that you see, all right? And so we got the Sea of Galilee. You see here a lot of Bible stories about them crossing the sea and the way that the, the structure of the landscape is. You see the mountains, that wind can come down that valley so quickly that they'll be in turmoil in an instant because of where the Sea of Galilee is located. But it's in Capernaum that a lot of ministry happened that Jesus was involved in. And it was in Capernaum that, uh, uh, that um, Simon and Andrew, uh, who were apostles of Jesus, that's where they lived. It was in Capernaum that Jesus healed Simon's mother-in-law who had the fever that was, uh, was life-threatening and he, he, uh, he just spoke and the fever left. It was in Capernaum that uh, they were in the synagogue and there was a demon-possessed guy that stood up and began to proclaim who Jesus was. And he didn't want people to know him by what he claimed, but he wanted them to know him by his works. And so he commanded the demon to shut up and leave the man, and he left. Now, can you imagine if that happened this morning in church? Now, everybody's thinking, I hope I'm not the one with the demon. I understand that part, Okay. But if that were to happen, it would be so miraculous that you would be going out and telling you're not going to believe what happened at Crossroads this morning. And guess how many people would be here next week? It would be full, right? Because we got something to tell. It was supernatural. And we want everybody to know about this. Well, Jesus was ministering and these events happened. And he healed the blind. He healed people of demon possession. And all the people were coming to get healed. And then Jesus got to the place. He said, listen, we've got to go to other places in Galilee as well. And so he left and began to travel around. Well, we pick up the story with him coming back to Capernaum. Because he stayed there. I think he was staying with Simon and Andrew. And so when he comes back, guess what? Everybody found out. So what do you think is going to happen if a guy comes back that cast out demons, that healed people of disease, that whatever he spoke happened and whatever disease you had was cured? What do you think the rest of the people that are still sick are going to do when he comes back? They're going to flock to him, aren't they? Because... I want to be healed. And so here we have the picture. I want you to understand the, the context of what is happening as Jesus comes back into town. And as he returns, uh, there's, a, there's, there's an encounter. Because there was one guy that we don't know his name who heard that Jesus was coming back but he could not get to Jesus to be healed because he was paralyzed. He couldn't walk. So he sees all the crowds are going to see Jesus. Jesus is coming to town, Jesus. And he's heard about all the things. And he realizes he's hopeless because he cannot get up to walk to where Jesus was. So when Jesus returned to Capernaum several days later, the news quickly spread that he was back home. Soon the house where he was staying was so packed with visitors that there was no room, no more room, even outside the door. Well, let's give you some context. When I was in India, we would preach in houses and they would actually go in there and clear everything out. But the house was uh, probably stretching it 12 by 12, maybe 12 by 14. That was the whole house. 
And so you're in there preaching, but people are, people are in the house. They're, they're sitting with the seats, and then you run out of seats, and they're standing around the, the walls, and then you run out of wall, and they're standing around the outside of the house. They're leaning in the windows. They're leaning in the doorway, and they're, the other, it's just so crowded. There's no way you can get in because it's so packed. And so I'd just be there preaching the gospel to this, full, this house full of people, and all the area around the house was full, and there's no possible way you could get one more person in the house, and that's what Jesus was doing that time there was nobody else that could get in and so as he's there preaching four men arrived carrying a paralyzed man on a mat they couldn't bring him to Jesus because of the crowd so they dug a hole through the roof above his head then they lowered the man on his mat right down in front of Jesus now let me help you put this into context. I want to show you a picture of what a typical roof looked like back then. Because they didn't have jackhammers up there, you know, trying to get into the roof. That's not the way it worked. This is your typical roof. Now, help, help yourself understand this. You got a guy that couldn't get there, but he actually had four friends that carried him. And then they get to the house, they can't get in. And you can sort of see how big the house is by the way the roof is. That's about your typical size. And so four guys carrying a guy go up on this roof. Now that was the first step of faith, right? I mean, how do you know where the logs are to step on, right? There's four of us. And so they get up there and they're on the roof and they've got to get the guy down to Jesus. And so they're tearing a hole in the roof. Now, if you're inside the house, guess what's falling on you? All the roof. And so you're sitting there and stuff's just falling. You're like, what is going on? And then you're like complaining to these guys. Hey, quit that. Stop. You know, we're all getting covered up. And so you're doing all that. You know, sort of like we are when we're at church sometimes. You know, man, why they got it so cold in here? Or man, why they got it so hot in here? Why are y'all so moody with all your control and temperature stuff, right? I mean, why can't y'all get balanced in your life and just like one temperature, right? I mean, so, you know, we always got something that doesn't fit us, right? And so they're in there and they're, they're just comforted and Jesus is up there and he's preaching away and, you know, he has to stop. I mean, it'd be like me trying to preach and somebody lowering from the roof right now. Y'all aren't looking at me. Listen, y'all can't even look at me when somebody gets up to go to the restroom, And they're lowering a guy on a mat. Now, now here's the thing. When they brought him to Jesus, they probably thought they were just going to walk through the door and lay him down. But now they're up on the roof. So there's some effort that went into this task. They carried him up on the roof and they realized we can't just drop him. We got to lower him. Hey, Bob, we're going to leave you here. We're going to get some rope. Well, you know he's not going anywhere because he can't go anywhere, right? So he'll be right there when you come back. So they went and got the rope and got everything. Oh, we got to have something to lower him on. So, you know, so they, they get all this stuff together. And so this is a big undertaking. And they began to lower him down. And he's probably thinking, please don't drop me. Please don't drop me. You ever did one of those trust falls where somebody got distracted and you fell? So they're lowering him. Everybody in the crowd, they're not even looking at Jesus anymore. They're like seeing this guy lower down. And he stops on the ground right in front of Jesus. I'm giving you all these details because I want you to picture in your mind what is happening. I mean, when I think of this, I'm thinking, wow, that's the kind of friends I want. Right? I mean, don't you want those kind of friends? Listen, if Jesus were coming to town and you couldn't walk and you knew he could heal you, wouldn't you want at least four friends that could carry you? I mean, that's a real friend, right? They don't say how far they had to carry him. I mean, it wasn't a, a small city. And so they had to carry him to wherever Jesus was. And in that process, they get there and they can't get in. So they go the extra mile so that their friend, they could just say, hey, you know what? We're going to have to get tickets next time. Jesus is full. And no, they went, they're like, 
we don't care. And as they're lowering them down, people are probably yelling and whatever they're doing, because I would be yelling, you know, stuff's falling on me. And they're probably, if they say, we don't care. We're focused. Our friend needs help. So here he is, right in front of Jesus. And notice the words next in Mark 2, 5. Seeing their faith, Jesus said to the paralyzed man, my child, your sins are forgiven. Now, as I'm reading through this, when I read through the Bible, I ask questions because I want to understand. If I'm paralyzed and I'm dropped, lowered down on a mat and gone to all this trouble and I'm thinking, Jesus is coming. I've never walked before. I can be healed. And they lay me in front of me. He says, your sins are forgiven. I'm like, I got cheated. I wanted the healing part, you know. I wanted sins are forgiven. And when I, was, when I was thinking about that, it reminds me so much of us. We come to Jesus sometimes and we have this idea of what we need, but Jesus gives us something different because he knows what we need. Amen. I mean, so often in our lives and in my life, we come to God because we have a physical need. We need, to, we need to bless us with a paycheck. We need to bless us with a car that runs. We need to bless us. And we, just, we need something physical in our life. And we come to Jesus on Sunday or whenever we come to him, we're in our devotion time. And we're crying out to him for this physical need. And God doesn't give it to us. But he gives us a spiritual need that's going to transcend our physical need so that we look at our physical need different and realize that God God is enough even when I don't get everything that I thought I needed. Amen. So here's this guy. Your sins are forgiven because Jesus saw the physical need of the man, but he realized because he's God that his spiritual need was far greater than his physical need. Because if I just heal his physical need and he walks out of this building, he'll be eternally lost and never have a chance to have his spiritual need met. And so God met his spiritual need first before he did anything physically for him because Jesus knew that that was the greater need in his life. And he also knew something else that he wanted to show everybody. Because in that crowd was some religious people and when they saw this, it says that some of the teachers of religious law were sitting there and they thought to themselves, what is he saying? This is blasphemy. Only God can forgive sins. When I look at that situation, I'm asking myself, why did they miss what Jesus just did? Why did they miss the power that he had? And why did they miss? Because they were so concerned about being right, about being intellectually correct, they thought they were, that they missed out on what God wanted to do. You know, sometimes when we come to church, sometimes when we read the Bible, sometimes when we're talking to other people, we want to be so right that we don't really care what Jesus is doing at the moment. We don't really care about the supernatural movement. And so we miss out on what God is trying to do. Let me give you an example. Every once in a while, our service will go long. It's always because of the announcements. It's never my fault, okay? <laughs> and then at the end, we have a baptism. But we're so unfocused on the baptism because we're thinking about what we need to do next. We miss out on what God is doing. And you know, sometimes there's a movement of God in the room where something happens and the altar is full and you're thinking, man, I got to get out of here. The Methodists are going to be at the buffet and they'll be before me and I have to wait in line. <laughs> and so you're so distracted, right? And here they were, they were so distracted that they missed out on what Jesus was doing in the moment. They missed out on that. And so it's so important that you and I, that we focus in and we stay focused on not me but we not me but we you know even in our room today when we have a service and I'm just going to call it out there's sometimes when the service is over you want to get to your kids first 
listen, they're having fun without you. Don't spoil it for them, right? But you leave because you're missing the moment in the room because you've got something else on your mind. Listen, you can't absorb the moment that Jesus wants you to have unless he has fully your attention in the moment. Amen? So don't let the enemy distract us. Even with our clapping. Guys, if you don't clap, let's clap like we're clapping for Jesus, all right? God deserves our full attention. And the guys that were lowering him down, God had their full attention. But Jesus, he saw these other people and he saw them in the crowd because, you know, if we're honest with ourselves, sometimes we are like those religious people, unfortunately. All of us are. And it's only by the spirit of God that we stay away from that area that we can have a tendency to drift into. And so Jesus responds to them. He says he knew, what they were th- he knew what they were thinking, so he asked them, why do you question in your heart? Is it easier, question this in your heart, is it easier to say to the paralyzed man, your sins are forgiven, or stand up and pick up your mat and walk? Church, what do you think is easier? I think it's easier for me to tell you your sins are forgiven. You can't see that, can you? If I said to Cody, who plays on our our, our guitar, Cody, your sins are forgiven. You didn't see anything happen, did you? You just heard my words. How do you know his sins were forgiven? The only person that knew was what happened in his heart, right? What happened to him and and what God knew in that moment. You might see it later on, but in that moment, you can't see that. So Jesus asked him the question, which is easier. He says, but so that you'll know that the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sins. Then Jesus turned to the paralyzed man and said, stand up, pick up your mat and go home. And the man jumped up, grabbed his mat, and walked out through the stunned onlookers. And they were all amazed and praised God, exclaiming, we've never seen anything like this before. And so here's, here's what's happening is, is this man who has never walked is laying there in front of Jesus. Now, I want you to understand the, the complexity of what's happening here. If you go to the hospital and you lay in a hospital bed, just say six weeks, do you know that the, your leg muscles and your muscles in your body start uh, experiencing atrophy? You know that many people after that time period have to go to physical therapy so they can walk again? And so this guy, just imagine, he's, he's never walked, so his legs look like bones with no muscle on them, and his brain is not communicating with his legs because they never moved. And so there's a lot of things going on. And so in an instant, Jesus tells the guy to get up. Well, Jesus, how is he gonna have the muscle to get up and to stand? And he's saying, I'm gonna give it to him. How's his brain gonna communicate with legs? I'm gonna give it to him. How's he gonna even know how to walk? He's never walked before in his life. How does he know to put one step in front of another? It's like teaching a baby, right? No, I'm gonna tell him how. You see, Jesus is not limited by what we're limited by. Jesus transcends our limitations and he is able to do far beyond what we think or imagine. We just got to ask him for it. Amen. Amen. Because listen to what it said. As they were lowering him down, Jesus saw their faith. How do you see faith? Faith is unseen isn't it faith is something that I have that's not you can't you can't look at me and say you have faith and uh you know it's it's this unseen thing that God gives us and so he's saying that he saw their how did he see their faith but he saw their faith by their actions right faith is seen by actions according to what James tells us in the book of James faith is demonstrated by my actions how did they demonstrate faith they tore the roof open they put him on his mat and they lowered him 
down. Every time and every move of lowering, they had faith that when he got there in front of Jesus, he would be healed. And so he looks at them and he says, their faith, not his faith. And I don't miss this. Your faith can affect somebody else's life. When we open this altar up for people to come down front and you come down, you may not have the faith to be healed, but somebody comes behind you and lays their hand on you and they have the faith that you will be healed. God will work through their faith in spite of your lack of faith. You want to know why we need each other, why we're more powerful together? Because sometimes in life, we don't have the faith to get us through the stronghold in our life. And we need the faith of our brothers and sisters in Christ to walk up beside us and say, hey, you don't have it, but I do. How about using my faith? How about leaning on my faith? How about letting my faith go through my body into your body and let God heal you? You see, church, we're not meant to walk alone. We're meant to walk together because when we walk together, we are stronger together. We're more powerful together. And God is saying that just like with these guys, when we allow our faith to be transferred into somebody else's life, then it changes their life. Amen. Amen. And so this man, <laughs> everybody was amazed. I mean, I'd be amazed, right? You seen that lately? You seen a person never walked in their life jump up and walk out? You've seen that's supernatural kind of stuff, right? And so the the word I, I, I love the the terminology he uses. He says that they were stunned. That just me <laughs> stunned. You didn't know. And then they were, they, they just, all they could do is worship God because they're like, there, there's no way that a man could have done this. You know, it had to be God. And then what he tells them, he said, hey, I want to prove to you that the Son of Man that has the power not only to forgive sins, but to heal. But here was the thing. The religious leaders stood there and missed the whole thing. They missed the moment. They missed the moment that God showed up in a supernatural way. They missed the moment. And you know, sometimes we miss the moments, don't we? We miss the moment when God does something supernatural because we get tied up in us. We come to church and it's about us sometimes. And let's just be honest, sometimes it's just about us. Sometimes maybe you're sitting right now and it's about you. You're, you're here and you're not really sure why you're here. Or you're watching online and your parent, they got you, you know, got you in the headlock so you can't move. And you're like, you know, I, I don't, you're going to miss the moment. Because you won't see the moment if you don't have faith to believe that there's going to be a moment. You won't see the moment if you don't have your eyes on Jesus, who is the one that creates the moment. God does that. And so if we're distracted, if we're trying to be here just to be right or be here to get our way, you know, where we're, we're analyzing everything, say, oh, you know, that song, they, they didn't hit that note right. Or that song, you know, they, 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 they miss that. Oh, and you just go through it and you're like, man, my coffee's cold today. Or man, and we were going through all the things that distract us. Listen, don't miss the moment, church. God wants to do something beyond that, but Satan wants to use everything to make us miss it. So let's don't give in to him. Let's stay with our eyes focused on Jesus. Just like the song said, Jesus, Jesus. You know, as I was writing the church, I don't remember songs, names of songs. I know what they are when we sing them. That's just, it's just me. I don't know why I do that or why I can't. But as I was praying this morning, I'm at church, I was like, man, it'd be a great song to sing this morning. And I get here and boom, we're singing that song. Now, if I'd have looked at the sheet, I'd already known that, uh, but I didn't. But God already had it planned out. And God does that. He has it planned out for you. You're here this morning. You're watching online this morning. You are tuning in because Jesus wants your attention. Jesus wants to do something in your life. And Jesus wants to do something in such a way that it dumbfounds you and all you can do is clap and say, praise God. But in this story, I don't want you to miss the part that's often overlooked by the crowd. 
they, could, they were praising Jesus. They were worshiping Jesus. But do you know where his four friends were? They were still on the roof. They couldn't get in. Nobody was clapping for them because they lowered him down. Nobody was hooting and hollering because they carried him all the way across town. Nobody was praising him because they went back and got the rope. Matter of fact, someone probably thinking, who's going to fix my roof? The heroes that got no praise whatsoever were the friends that cared enough to bring their friend to Jesus. You see, it's not the glamorous job, is it? Somebody never notices. They don't notice that you invited. They don't notice that you had a conversation. But, they, but God notices that you cared enough to bring your friend to Jesus. You see, there are some friends that will never make it to Jesus unless somebody brings them, right? This was one of those friends that he would never get to Jesus if somebody did not bring him. And so these guys that cared enough about their friend that they had spent time with in their life, they cared enough to pick him up and carry him. And listen, they didn't care about anybody's excuses. Listen, oh man, that's, that's too far to carry him. Oh man, there are too many people in the room. We can't get in the room. Oh man, they're, they're gonna be really mad at us when we tear this roof up. And you know, they, they could have went on and on. Oh man, we don't even have any rope hey we're going to dump you hope you'll be okay when you hit the ground Jesus is there maybe he'll heal you they just took him right why because that's what friends do friends go the extra mile don't they don't you want friends like that I mean if I had to pick my friends these four I want these four If I'm ever in a pickle, these guys are on speed dial. Matter of fact, we got a group text or Snapchat, whatever, however you do it. Some of you are sending a letter in the mail. I know it's going to be a while before they get there, but just go ahead and send it. And some of you are saying, what is mail? It's how you get your bills, okay? Yeah, it's the internet. I don't want to know where I am. So here's the thing. What kind of friend are we? You see, if we want those kind of friends, you attract the kind of friends that you are, right? Since I'm reading this, I'm asking myself, not just you, I'm asking myself, Greg, what kind of friend are you? And you know, sometimes I have a win, you know, I check, ooh, I was a good friend. Sometimes I'm like, I got some work to do. God, you got some work to do. I think of my friend, his name is James. And James works out at the gym where I work out. You know why I work out at the gym? It's not just to stay in shape. It's because I work in a building where I think most of the staff are saved. I'm pretty sure. Uh, but, you know, I'm around Christians all day. And it's not that I don't like Christians. God sent me here so that lost people could know him, right? Not just Christians. So I, I, I go to the gym because there are people there that don't know Jesus. And so I'm there, and I, I got a friend with a guy named James, and he's, a, he's probably in his 70s. And we talk all the time. I'm the kind of guy that I, I talk to everybody, okay? And so when you come to the gym, you think I actually run the gym because I talk to everybody. And so James and I, we were over there on one side of the gym, and we were just small talking. And God reminded me that... He's had a battle with cancer. And he's fighting health things in his life. And I felt like God just put it on my heart. Greg, do you know if James knows me? Because he's 70-something years old. He could leave any time. And so I'm sitting there doing this exercise machine, and I looked at James. I said, James, I said, you know, we cut up, we have fun, we do all this stuff. I said, but can I ask you a serious question? Do you know Jesus Christ is your personal Savior? And James looked at me, smiled. 
He said, Greg, I wouldn't have made it this far without Jesus. Amen. 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 And you know, I, I thought that moment was for James. But I think that moment was for me. Because you know, sometimes we let fear trump friendship. Sometimes, and I'm not just speaking to you, I'm speaking to me, okay? Let's, no, nobody throw any stones up here. Sometimes we're not the friend that we need to be because we're afraid if we say something, they'll stop being our friend. We're afraid to have that encounter with them because we're afraid they might reject us and then we won't have a friend anymore. Do you know statistically that's a lie though? Because statistically, if you invited somebody to come to church with you, 70% of the people would say yes. So you're going to win most of the time. And no doesn't mean no, I don't like you anymore. No just means I'm not ready yet. You see, God tells us, he says, I have not given you a spirit of fear, but of power and love and of a sound mind. You see, our problem is not fear, church. Our problem is, is so many times we don't walk in the power of the Holy Spirit. We walk in the power of our flesh. And when you step into an encounter and you're afraid to invite your friend, you know you're not walking in the power of the Spirit because the Spirit will cast out that fear. Why? Because he hasn't given us a spirit of fear. When that spirit of fear comes on me, you know that there's something spiritually deficient in your life right then. And you maybe just need to step away and say, God, I just need, I need your power right now. I'm feeling I need to speak. And Lord, I am not receiving this spirit of fear. I am taking on my spirit of power that you've given me. And what's going to happen is you're not even going to think about what they're going to say to you. You're just going to be obedient to the Holy Spirit, knowing that he has the power to convict where he needs to convict so church don't think that you have a deficiency in that you can't make the ask just realize that maybe you and I need to hang out with Jesus a little bit more so that when we get out here in the world we're not concerned about being liked we're concerned about being a true friend to somebody that needs to be brought to Jesus amen amen I mean, isn't, isn't that the kind of friend you want? The kind of friend that says, hey, will you come and have a cup of coffee with me? The kind of friend that's praying for you. Doesn't even know, you don't even know they're praying for you. I have another friend at the gym and he is a Muslim by faith. And I, I've known him for, at this point, I've known him probably three or four months. And we were talking. We actually had a conversation down in the locker room one day. And uh, I sort of threw Jesus out. And he started throwing his Muslim uh, faith stuff out. And I'm like, all right, this is a longer conversation than right now. So I just prayed for him. You see, God's power is bigger than my words. But when God's power is in my words, there's power. So one day he says, hey, I'd like to meet with you. All right. Come by my office on such and such time. He shows up. Hey, I just want to talk to you because this Muslim thing is not working for me. I ain't said nothing yet, right? I just prayed. And God moved the heavens. God moved the spiritual realm. God moved his heart. And he's asking me this question. It's like God said, Greg, you just watched me work. Amen. Amen. You see, sometimes we're fearful because we think it's up to us. Church, it's not up to us. Our responsibility is just to be a friend that wants to pray enough to get you into the kingdom of heaven and not just be a friend that wants you just to like me, all right? If you like me and I go to hell, I'm not, I, I'm not enjoying that, okay? Like me enough to invite me to eternity with you. 
That's a friend. You know what? I want to be a better friend. What about you? I just do. I wish I could say that I win every time, but I don't. I want to be a better friend this year. And this is how I'm going to start, and I want to challenge you to start. One person that you're going to pray for every week. Say, why not every day? Listen, that's 52 times in a year. That's more than you're doing now, okay? One person pray for every week. What am I praying for? That God would save them. That God would save them. And then, in your prayer, say, God, let me take advantage of your opportunity. Because God's going to open the door for a conversation. It's going to happen. And you're going to get to do something. What are you going to do? What are you going to do in that moment? Hey, invite them to something. Super Bowl party. Boom. COVID's going on. Wear your mask. Wear your gloves. Get your hazmat suit. Hey, listen, just because COVID's going on don't mean that Jesus said time out on people getting saved. Amen. Come on, church. Jesus is, oh, you know what? We're not going to let anybody go anywhere for this time period until COVID's over. Listen. People are dying right now and we're mourning the fact that they're dying. We should mourn the fact that they don't know Jesus if they die. And so we need to be about the Father's business. We need to be friends with those people so that they can know Jesus. Because listen, it's not a bad thing to die if you go to heaven. It's a real bad thing to die if you don't. Pray for one person. You say, God, I got so many people. Start with one. And I want you to come over here and write their name on this wall. You can just put first name. You don't have to put their name, address, and phone number, okay? We don't, we're not going that far. Just write their name. And this is why I want you to write their name. Because when you come here early, instead of sitting down, wondering, nobody likes me, go over here to the wall and pray for other people. On Wednesday, 9.15, our staff comes in here. Boom, we're over there praying. You can come on Wednesday at 9.15 if you're available. And as you and I pray, God's going to move on. But then as the doors open, invite them. Invite them to church. Invite them to your small group. Invite them to an event. Invite them to students. Invite them to something. That's what friends do, right? Hey, we don't mind inviting them to a ball game. Invite them to something that's going to change their life. Listen, it's that simple. I'm going to invest my life in them through prayer. And I'm going to invite them to something where they can connect to God. And that connection may be a conversation with me. But I want to be a better friend. And the way I become a better friend is I love them enough to bring them to Jesus. Hey, if you were my friend, which you are, and I was lost... I would hope that we had the kind of friendship that you wouldn't let me die without knowing Jesus. Isn't that the kind of friend you want? Can we commit together this year to asking God to allow us to be that kind of friend? Can we do that together as a church? If you're online, you can do that. Listen, as a matter of fact, if you're online, you can message us right now with the name that you have and we will write it on there for you. Because we know some people are still shut down because they have health things that would be very complicated if they got COVID. I understand that. But that doesn't mean you can't call your friend. That doesn't mean you can't text your friend. That doesn't mean you can't Instagram them. That doesn't mean you can't create other ways to connect. And so church, God is calling us to love our friends enough to bring them to Jesus. But you know, I realize there are people in this world that you are still are looking and you're still searching. There's something missing in your heart. And you know what you need from Jesus right now? You need Jesus just to step into your life and say, my child, your sins are forgiven. 
you have messed up so many times and right now you're living in a mess up and you're wondering if God could ever accept you, if God could ever love you. And what I want you to understand this morning, no matter where you are, God can accept you and God can love you because when he hung on the cross, he spread his arms out and he's waiting for you to come to him so that you can know what true forgiveness is so that he can forgive you and then you can forgive yourself. You need to be let off the hook so that you can know what life really is. It starts with Jesus. And so I want to just ask you to bow your heads right now. And if you need to take that step, you say, God, I just need forgiveness. I need to be saved this morning. Then what God is asking you to do is surrender to him. And so if you're online sitting at your house on your sofa or you're in your bed, I just want you to lift your hands straight up. Both hands as a sign of surrender to God and your decision this morning to say, Jesus, I need your forgiveness. I want you to be my savior. If you're in the room and that's where you are, you say, God, I need you to forgive me. I realize that I'm hopeless with Without you and this morning I want you to heal my soul with your hands raised to wherever you are pray this with me Jesus this morning I surrender my life to you I confess my sin and ask you to forgive me ask you to heal me ask you to save me as I believe your death and your resurrection are my pathway to forgiveness in life. Thank you, Jesus, for being my Savior. And God, as your church, awaken us. Lord, help us not to be okay with our friends not knowing you, God. Help us not to walk through this year without loving our friends enough to bring them to Jesus, God. Help us to be so awake and alive, God, that we don't miss the opportunity to see your miraculous work around us. Lord God, open our eyes so that we can proclaim who you are and so that the world will know that you still heal. The world will know that you still forgive. It's in Christ's name we pray, amen. Church, let's stand to our feet. If you invited Jesus into your life, you raised your hand. I want you to come down here and tell one of our folks down here that I invited Jesus into my life this morning and I'm not ashamed of it. If you need somebody to pray over you or pray with you, then please come down here. Or maybe you just need some time to yourself where you release some things in your life that God's wanting to release you from. This is our chance to worship and some of our worship is response. So let's praise him this morning.